uh, requires the FCC to adopt final rules facilitating equal access to broadband Internet. More specifically, the statutory text directs the FCC to prevent discrimination in broadband access based on income level, race, ethnicity, color, religion, or national origin, while also directing the Commission to consider issues of technical and economic feasibility. This provision, particularly with respect to the prohibition on income-based discrimination, raises many difficult questions. To help answer these questions, we have an excellent panel of experts today. I'm very pleased to be joined by Jessica Malugan, Commissioner Robert M. McDowell, and Eric Fruits. Jessica Malugan is Director of the Center for Technology and Innovation at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Her research focuses on technology issues, including antitrust, telecommunications, social media content, and net neutrality regulations. Her writings have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, USA Today, Bloomberg Law, National Review, among others. And she is a frequent guest on Fox and Fox Business Channels. She is a 2022 and 2023 Innovation Network Foundation Antitrust and Competition Policy Fellow. Robert M. McDowell is a partner at Cooley LLP and is co-chair of its Global Communications Practice Group, where he advises telecommunications, media, and technology clients on their most significant regulatory, legal, and business matters. As a former commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, Commissioner McDowell has been at the forefront of the most complex and groundbreaking issues facing the telecommunications, media, and technology sectors. He was first appointed to the FCC by President George W. Bush in 2006 and again by President Obama in 2009. He was unanimously unanimously confirmed both times by the U.S. Senate. Commissioner McDowell also served on the U.S. diplomatic delegation to the 2012 World Conference on International Telecommunications. He's often called upon for speaking engagements and frequently appears on TV and radio. He has written opinion pieces for many high-profile publications, including the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post. He serves as a senior fellow for the Hudson Institute and is on the board of directors of Shared Spectrum Corporation. He also has served on the board of directors for the Potomac School and the board of visitors for Duke University's Sanford School of Public Policy. Eric Fruits is a senior scholar at the International Center for Law and Economics and an adjunct professor, professor at Portland State University. His research focuses on antitrust, telecommunications, intellectual property, and securities markets. His academic research has been published in the Journal of Law and Economics, Journal of Real Estate Research, Municipal Finance Journal, and OECD publications. Op-eds and letters published by The Economist, Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Examiner, at USA Today, as well as many local magazines and newspapers. Each of our panelists will do around five minutes or so addressing some of the larger issues um, and that are brought up by Section 60506's requirements and how the FCC may potentially handle them in its NPRM. After that, we have some questions lined up from our atten- uh, for our attendees that we can address. On that note, if you do have a question, please submit it using the Q&A feature. Uh, we ask that you include your name and affiliation with your question. If you would prefer not to have it um, disclosed, you can note that. Uh, and when you uh, put those questions in the Q&A feature, I will queue those up uh, for uh, during our Q&A discussion session. First, we're going to hear from Jessica. Hi, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us here today. I'm going to set the table here a little bit, and then I'll uh, let Rob and Eric get into the details uh, with you. But the, the big picture here is 2021's Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Did a lot of things for a lot of things, spends a lot of money, but the part we're interested in today is the $65 billion it spends to allocate broadband. So the uh, well-meaning overall goal here uh, is that we get to 100% connectivity, right, with a certain quality of broadband access. Um, are the estimates correct of who does not have this? I don't know. Perhaps a question for later on in uh, today's panel. But uh, some estimates, the White House estimate they used was that 30 million Americans um, live in areas where they don't have access to broadband. We'll get into it. Um, so a couple uh, requirements come with this funding for providers. Um, they are required to offer low rate affordable plans. Um, but the one we're going to talk about today is that there's a built in requirement to this legislation that the FCC adopts rules. The due date is this fall, November 15th, I believe, uh, coming up quickly, um, that they adopt rules banning digital discrimination. What does it mean? No one knows. Don't feel bad. That's what we're here to fight about. Um, In the statute, it says that um, providers cannot discriminate on the basis of, and these are not in the order they appear because I'm saving the whopper for the end, race, ethnicity, color, religion, national origin. Okay, so far so good. But here is the hitch in the giddy up. Um, Income level. 
income level. We'll come back to that. Remember that. Um, so that piece makes the FCC's job of deciding what is digital discrimination so they can make sure it's not happening um, a little bit more tricky. Um, because are we talking about an intent to discriminate based on these things? Or are we talking about um, a disparate impact? Maybe they don't mean to be discriminating on those things. But here we are, and are we here to fix the cause or the result? So we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, but one more thing I want to highlight that makes the income level language complicating um, is that also in the statute, providers are allowed to take into consideration economic and technical feasibility. So one might ask themselves from a 30,000 foot view, uh, is income level part of economic feasibility? We will discuss. Stay tuned. Um, and before I hand it over um, so we can get more into all of that, I will just say that, you know, the subsidized money that's coming through might change the numbers in that equation of economic feasibility, but it doesn't change the equation itself, right? Either that's something that is allowed to take into consideration because these are pro for-profit companies, to what exchange does that, to what extent is that being subsidized um, impact those considerations? It is, um, it's murky waters. So with that, I hope we're up to date and ready to vehemently disagree. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Rob, why don't you go next? Absolutely. Well, well, first of all, thanks to ICLE for putting us together. This is a, a, a bit of a sleeper issue. Uh, and um, it's going to become a higher profile issue, I think, as we get closer to the comment deadline of a week from tomorrow and the reply comments on March 21st. Um, I do think this is one of the most consequential uh, FCC proceedings in recent years. Uh, and I say it was a sleeper issue because the world was focused on the infrastructure spending of the IIJA uh, and not this provision, these uh, few hundred words regarding broadband. Um, and it was put there, I'm sure, with the best of intentions by Congress. Uh, we need to come up with a snappier name than 60506, so maybe uh, folks in the chat can uh, come up with a snappier name for it. Um, but if its uh, ostensible purpose, at least, is to prevent or to cure discrimination in the course of access, uh, providing access to broadband. But effectuating the policy will be very hard, however, um, and it may have unintended consequences or unforeseen consequences and effects. Um, but the FCC says that, or the law says, rather, the FCC must issue rules by November 15th. So real quickly, some background. Most people don't think of the FCC as having jurisdiction over civil rights issues, but it does and has to a limited extent. Um, one area, of course, is in the context of broadcast ownership, media ownership. And just a quick anecdote before we jump into the meat of this. So I was a commissioner for seven years from 06 to 2013. Very early in my tenure, David Honig of MMTC uh, came to me and ex explained a number of issues to me, one of which was there uh, was a practice by the bulk buyers of radio advertising time to have what they call no urban and no Hispanic dictates in radio advertising buying. And as he was explaining this and other issues to me, I said, wait, what? How does that work? What, what, uh, this is not a, my world. Uh, of buying ads on radios, uh, radio with time in bulk. Um, so he explained it to me. So yeah, there are, it's not necessarily the fault of the product, let's say the manufacturer of a car that wants to sell cars. Uh, they hire an ad agency, which then hires brokers. Uh, but there was this dictate that if you wanted to sell a Mini Cooper, let's say, and have radio ads for them, that the buyers would not be buying on urban formatted radio stations or Hispanic Spanish language radio stations. And so I said, that's crazy. Uh, I, I don't understand how that's even legal. It's also stupid. It's just stupid business. Uh, wouldn't you want to sell to everybody? Don't you want to sell more cars, not less? So I said, well, how long has this been a proposal before the FCC? And he said about 20, 25 years and it's gone nowhere. So I went to uh, my friend uh, and fellow commissioner at the time, Jonathan Adelstein. Long story short, before we bogged down in this particular aspect, we got it taken care of uh, under the Kevin Martin FCC in a 5-0 vote rather quickly. Um, so there's there's precedent for the FCC being involved in sort of the civil rights area. And so uh, it's not entirely surprising that there would be another 
um, piece of legislation coming out of Congress. So okay, let's jump into it. So the NPRM uh, is trying to interpret the statute, the mandate by Congress, to adopt a definition of digital discrimination of access, as used in paragraph B1 uh, of 60506. And I'm going to, the words are important, so I, I don't want to bog us down too much here, but I want to read what it says so the, the folks who are just sort of learning about this for now understand. So, quote, this is the FCC, quote, we therefore propose to define digital discrimination of access for purposes of this proceeding as one or a combination of the following. One, policies or practices not justified by genuine issues of technical or economic feasibility that differentially impact consumers access to broadband Internet access service based on their income level, as Jessica alluded to, race, ethnicity, color, religion, or national origin, and or, and we'll get back to this interesting novel use of and or <laughs> in a proposal, two, policies or practices not justified by genuine issues of technical or economic feasibility that are intended to differentially uh, impact consumers' access to broadband, internet access service based on their income level, race, ethnicity, color, religion, or national origin. That's in paragraph 12 for those of you playing at home. So these words invoke a longstanding debate in civil rights law and jurisprudence. Um, these are legal terms of art, uh, and they invoke disparate treatment and disparate impact. So many decades have we seen litigation and sometimes congressional action uh, over these, these issues. So here's a quick overview, and we can dive into it more later if, if folks have questions, but Disparate treatment. So that essentially focuses on discriminatory intent. So it is a uh, less favorable treatment, disparate treatment, is less favorable treatment of an individual in a protected class. The company, or in this case, internet service provider, I'm going to use the term, by the way, ISP, rather than broadband internet access service provider, and the acronym for that is BIAS, and we're talking about discrimination, could be talking about BIAS with a small b, so I'm just going to say ISP. So the ISP must intend to discriminate under a disparate treatment standard. Um, so it argues that the individuals suffered less favorable treatment than similarly situated individuals due to the ISP's intent to do so. And historically, to build on what Jessica was saying a few minutes ago, the basis for the less favorable treatment invokes an individual's race, religion, sex, color, or national origin, uh, not historically income level. So that's an overview of disparate treatment. Disparate impact <clears throat> is different. In civil terms, disparate impact focuses on discriminatory effect with no requirement to improve, uh, uh, to prove intent of discrimination. So a complainant may allege that an entity's policies and practices have discriminatory results. And although a practice may appear neutral in its face, the consequences of that entity's practices allegedly negatively affect a protected class. Okay, so this is the notion of a protected class is, is in both. Um, so you could kind of hypothetically say, look, the ISP is not offering service to the complainant uh, or the complainant's neighborhood or region. Therefore, it is discriminating against that complainant in violation of 60506. That's kind of a strict liability standard. I'm saying that. That's not the, what the commission is saying. And I'm saying that for illustrative purposes, so there might be uh, folks tweeting about that. But uh, it's you're not there. You're not serving that area or that customer. Therefore, you're presumed to be discriminating against them. So what's curious about this NPRM is the FCC proposes um, uh, what appears to be both, uh, both disparate uh, treatment and impact in interpreting this and or, uh, the use of and or, okay? But what's even more interesting is that it appears to be proposing an implied safe harbor with each by including the language, quote, not justified by genuine issues of technical or economic feasibility, end quote. So, and that's in both uh, sections there. This implies that the commission could be leaning towards an intent-based or disparate treatment standard. Uh, for example, if an ISP has a, quote, a genuine issue of technical or economic feasibility, that makes it extremely difficult or prohibitively expensive or otherwise somehow impossible to serve a complainant, that would appear to rebut the almost strict liability disparate impact standard. So infeasibility appears to rebut a presumption of discriminatory intent. 
But the FCC's proposed language, and I'm going to wrap up with this, um, does not fall neatly within the definition of disparate impact versus treatment as laid out in federal court precedent, such as in the Supreme Court's 2015 inclusive communities decision. And that tells us that clear statutory language is needed if an agency is to use a disparate impact standard. And it appears from just the plain language of 60506 that the technical and economic feasibility language undercuts an argument that it was Congress's intent that the FCC should adopt a disparate impact standard. But many groups filed in the notice of inquiry phase of this proceeding last year, arguing passionately for just such a standard as disparate impact standard. I assume they'll repeat uh, those calls uh, in the upcoming NPRM's uh, record and the comment process here. So we shall see how the FCC decides this important issue, and a lot will de be determined by whether or not we have five commissioners or the four who are currently there. So sorry for the long-winded intro, but thank you very much uh, again. I look forward to the Q&A. That was, that was great, Rob. Not long-winded at all. And uh, for the record, I agree that calling it 60506 all the time is extremely cumbersome, and uh, I, I don't know what the word should be, but yes. Uh, Eric, why don't you wrap up the introduction, the introductory remarks for us? Well, gee, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and I think you, uh, Rob and Jessica really laid this out really nicely because it is a really important issue. It's an important issue because the rules haven't been made yet. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities for people like us, but also out in the public to weigh in on this and identify what they think are the most important issues on this. It, to me, what I think is the most interesting is this addition of income as a quote unquote protected class. Uh, I'm not aware of that ever really happening before. And it raises the questions because income based discrimination is one issue, but then when you put on the other side that you have to take account of the technical and economic feasibility, then you've got what, what I call an income conundrum because there are so many of the factors that affect economic feasibility are correlated and probably sometimes even highly correlated with income. So, for example, uh, if you look out in the research, uh, it's widely accepted that population density is is an important, if not maybe the most important factor affecting ISP's deployment decisions. For example, it's more cost effective to invest in an area with higher population spread across a smaller geographic area, which just kind of makes sense. Uh, but it's also demonstrated with how a lot of these deployments happen. But it, it turns out that population density is also correlated with uh, with income. It's also correlated with uh, the minority share of the population. And it's correlated with a whole host of other demographic characteristics. An another issue here that I've I've seen as I've been researching this is the issue regarding access versus adoption. Now, if you look at the law, the IIJA is explicitly limited to this, to regulating access uh, rather than adoption. So access is, can you get the broadband? Adoption is, do you actually buy it or sign up for it? Uh, but nevertheless, if you look out in the, in the press and even among people who seemingly know better, these two concepts are often conflated, whether it's intentional or not, that's not an issue, but they do get conflated. And I think one reason why they get Conflate is because uh, it's obvious that access is necessary for adoption. If it's not available, you're not going to adopt it. But sometimes people turn around and, and they infer that a lack of adoption uh, somehow demonstrates a lack of access. And I don't think the evidence is there that a lack of adoption, that in fact, a lack of adoption does not demonstrate a lack of access. For example, I think the GAO reported a couple of years ago that about 30% of low-income households with access to broadband still don't adopt it. Uh, the other thing, too, I think, that if you're looking on the economic feasibility side, is that projected adoption rates must necessarily factor into deployment decisions. Uh, just, again, from a common sense level, there's really no point in making an investment in an area if you don't expect to be sufficient adoption in that area. Uh, in other words, you're just rolling out broadband that no one's going to buy. So I think in some ways, um, you know, the, that that decision to adopt uh, is also going to, in some ways, affect the access. And the other thing, too, is if now if you look at the factors related to adoption, if you believe that adoption rates are important, you know, one of the factors that lead to adoption, you know, the key one is the ability 
and or the willingness to pay for broadband. Uh, another factor that's highly cited is home computer ownership. Another one is educational attainment. Another one is age. And if you look out there, almost all of these factors are also correlated with income. So, again, I argue that this presents an income conundrum. If you had, even if you had a provider that went out of its way to explicitly avoid considering income, the CEO says, you're not allowed to look at income, get it out of your spreadsheets, forget it. You could still use all these other factors that are allowed, such as home computer ownership, educational attainment, density, uh, possibly age. Um, you put all those in your model and you make your deployment decision. Well, then you could get a go-getter statistician that can run some regressions and will find that income is a key factor related to deployment because income is so highly correlated with all these other things. And in fact, I don't even think you need to find a go-getter statistician because if you ran a regression and you left income out of your statistical model and you submitted it to a journal, the journal reviewers would think you're an idiot. They'd reject your paper and say, dude, you've got to have income in here because it's a key driver. And you're like, well, I'm not putting it in here because they don't consider income. And so that's why with this conundrum, you've got this real problem where if income is so highly correlated with things that you're allowed to consider, and also it's correlated with things you're not allowed to consider, such as uh, uh, race and ethnicity and so forth, you've got this you've got this income conundrum where you could find discrimination even if not even. More than just if you're just trying to avoid discrimination, but even if you're explicitly avoiding it and saying we will not discriminate based on income, someone will find that you are. And so that's why we've argued in our paper, and I think you have a link in the invitation when we sent you to the webinar. That's why we argue that really adopting an intent-based standard uh, is really the only right way to go uh, rather than focusing on one that fishes for desperate impacts. Because I think if you – have a standard that, that looks, that tries to find or measures disparate impacts, you're going to have a lot of what are known as false positives, where you will find discrimination even where it's not there or even when it's, you know, actively trying to be avoided. And so I think this is all part of a very important conversation because uh, the FCC is really stepping into new territory here, and there's still an opportunity to have a good discussion that can affect policy. Really great. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Jessica and Rob. Uh, so just a reminder to everybody in the audience that we uh, are open for Q&A. We have some questions queued up, uh, but I actually, based on what um, Eric and Rob and Jessica were just talking about, I'm going to take moderator's privilege um, and ask a question. Um, this is something that I've, I've been trying to puzzle through as I have looked at the digital discrimination proceedings since last year. Um, so, uh, there, the problem is on the access versus adoption point. There's a number of programs that the FCC and other agencies have had that have been very successful at providing subsidies to low-income users, like the ACP, for instance, comes to mind that came out during the, the pandemic. Um, doesn't doesn't this provide the sort of baseline, um, essentially, income substitution effect for for low-income consumers that essentially disappears the problem that's be, trying to be solved? So it, it creates this weird logical situation in which the government is actually providing support for low income people. So there is the money out there and the providers want to go out and get this money. Um, and yet at the same time, the government is turning around and saying, but you're not deploying to these people that we're giving you the money to deploy to. And, and those two things don't seem to make sense to me. I was wondering if, you, if there were some comments from from our panel on that. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I take. Oh, oh sorry, Rob. No, go ahead. Oh, I, I mean, I take your point, and I think that's what I mean about it might change the numbers in the equation, but it might not change the equation. And um, I'll just tell you, if you're um, professionally obligated and kind of a nerd, and you go out and you listen to a lot of people who are involved in writing this statue talk about what was happening, um, what did they really mean by this? Um, and an interesting thing they keep coming back to is just that their question is um, – we wanted the FCC to find out if the digital discrimination is happening. Go do the study, go improve the maps, go out and look. And if it is happening, then we need to fix it. But um, that seems to be at least um, from the right where where their head was at in, in pushing this on the FCC. Um, and, of course, there's a lot of uh, economic evidence so far that depending on how you define it, it's really not 
happening in an in, intent sort of way. Um, the other part that I think is interesting about is this is the subsidy money taking that variable out of it. And we can see what's really driving these decisions is that if you hear from people, advocates um, who would prefer a disparate impact test and would prefer more and more funding, that's what they say about this very process that, you know, this is a great start, but this isn't even enough because really when you get down to it, there's a certain amount of people that you're going to offer access to and they're not going to take you up on it. Well, why is that? Because, you know, they're just living off their handheld device. So we need subsidies for a, a tablet for it. And this is not word for word what an advocate on that side said recently, but pretty close. You know, you can't expect these low income families to all be sharing one laptop or one tablet. So just to say, I don't think however much money you subsidize all the way up the stack, now you get two tablets for everyone in your house. Now you get a laptop on top of those two tablets. Now you get, you know, an injection in your brain that makes you want to go online. It will never really be enough for those who want to see bad intentions here to say, okay, that's not what's happening, right? Hmm. Because, um, I, I mean, I wasn't surprised to hear them say that, but I think it, it, it informs the debate that even if we can say, okay, let's, let's hold for one variable there by replacing income levels with these subsidies, then what do we see? Which would be my instinct to say, well, let's spend this money and see what happens. Like, hmm. let's, let's see what, what happens to adoption when there's access and we've, um, kind of weighted that variable of income and see what happens. But I will just tell you that the next step in that process for some people will be, and then what if we get everyone five laptops? And then what if, you know what I mean? It just, it, at some point there's, there's, there's this sort of ethereal question and economics, I think, so, settles it for some of us, but won't settle it for some people, no matter how good the maps are and no matter how good the regressions are. Um, mm -hmm. There is this idea that there's just systemic problems in how the free enterprise system allocates resources um, and that you can never do enough to counteract that. So um, right. I, I think that's a, probably a part people who think that way probably aren't, aren't here today. So I, I want to just sort of mention that um, worldview as we talk about it. Well, and I think your, your point is, is great. And it, um, it highlights the, the distinction between uh, provider-based mandates and um, sort of the user-consumer side man, uh, uh, subsidies. Requiring providers to act in a certain way that doesn't conform to the, the market signals that exist out there creates distortions that lower the potential for broadband to be deployed. Overspending on laptops makes, you know, Dell and Microsoft and Apple happy, and maybe it wastes some 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 funds, but it doesn't distort investment in any way, which which those are distinct. Rob, you had your hand up. I did, and uh, excellent points um, and, and good observations. And so, you know, a little bit of historical context too as we go forward. And by the way, I should have said at the outset, I'm not speaking on any particular on behalf of any client. I'm just uh, on my own, um, shooting from the hip here. But so when you go back to cross subsidization of the Bell system, uh, that was about making good old fashioned telephone service like my grandmother's phone over here on my shoulder. Uh, affordable. So you had business rates uh, subsidizing residential. You had long distance uh, subsidizing local. You had urban and suburban subsidizing rural, right? So uh, those, they were the people paying a kind of above cost or maybe way above cost in order to make it more affordable for the rancher who's, you know, 50 miles outside of town. And uh, you have to string up uh, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of a wire and telephone poles that you'll never recoup that investment on. Okay. So then you go to the, uh, the, actually the Reagan administration that started the lifeline and link up program. Uh, it, during the Obama administration, it was unfairly, and I said so at the time when I was a commissioner called the Obama phone. You may remember that for wireless, but it actually this concept was started under the Reagan era FCC. A lot of people don't know that. And then, then there was the 1996 telecom act in section 254 and it codified universal service. All right. So, it has been the will, the explicit will of Congress now for 27 years, certainly through Section 254, for there to be some sort of subsidization in this area, including for advanced services, which is the term enumerated in Section 254. All right. So now we have 60506, uh, which is harder to say than 254. Uh, and uh, 
uh, that uh, is not quite as explicit. It's sort of more general or horatory, right? It's like, hey, FCC, come out with some rules to prevent digital discrimination. And what we mean by digital, we think, is broadband internet access. But then the FCC, in its 448 apparently questions, uh, asks about, does digital mean the broader digital ecosystem? Does that mean the edge? Does it mean devices to per what you know what Jessica was just saying? Um, and I should rewind the tape a little bit. In January of 2012, so we, we did some major universal service reform in October of 2011, including I got the first ever reverse auctions and a subsidy program put in there, and that was a 4-0 vote. Um, there were only four of us uh, at the time. And then in January, I had a partial dissent on reform of Lifeline because Julius Chinikowski wanted to start a pilot program for devices uh, as part of uh, Lifeline. And I said, look, that's outside the scope of 254. Well, now you can argue that maybe there's uh, it's, there's a broader mandate from Congress. But is it needed? This is kind of a bottom line. thing. So you have the ACP program, uh, and I have some real-time researchers uh, popping up. So I have three screens, so I apologize if I'm looking around. So 16.2 million households are benefiting from the ACP program, which run out of money next year. I point everyone, I want to make sure everyone looks at former Commissioner Mike O'Reilly's op-ed from last week uh, on, on making the case, he says, for a continuation of that program. Um, you have CTIA saying 99% of Americans have access to LTE. So quick footnote, then I'll shut up because I want to make sure I don't take all of Eric's <laughs> time. I apologize, which is wireless is different. Wireless is easier to deploy. Wire, wireless is radio waves. They go across political boundaries, you know, these, these waves of energy through buildings, et cetera, across neighborhoods. Um, and it's easier to build that out. So in that wireless, be it, <clears throat> excuse me, fixed wireless through 5G technologies or other things has changed the equation here. And so 99% of America has access to LTE. What problem is the, is Congress trying to solve and what does digital access mean? So I'll, I'll pause there and yep. let others take up the time. Excellent. Uh, Eric, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I recall seeing somewhere that <clears throat> a large percent, something like 25 to 30 percent, some estimates I saw, uh, find that, you know, 25 to 30 percent of people who qualify for ACP don't take it up, but, you know, which raises some, I think, some interesting questions regarding access um, to the extent of how much does uh, a program like ACP nudge people who would not otherwise adopt uh, broadband nudge them into broadband uh and i I don't have a good uh, figure on that and you know i think that's one of the issues that that you have with a program like acp i think it's effective i think it does certainly help people uh funny thing about uh the the obama phone you were talking about i was uh working with um some uh some low-income people just the other week and, and like three or four of them said i've got an obama phone that's what they call it i mean that's uh, that is now entered the lexicon, and uh, one of the guys in the room said, "What's an Obama phone?" And we had to explain to him that's that essentially. You know. Sounds like positive branding in that case, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, I think Obama is really proud of that. Um, uh, but you know, I, I think one of the things that, that gets me is I, I think there is a um, there is a value to having some sort of demand side um, efforts to get to increase adoption. But I think, you know, if you really want to find a way where you, you know, just in basic economics, if you want to increase quantity and you want to decrease price, what you really have to do is figure out a way to increase supply. And and that is trying to change um, the the return on investment calculation, because it's it's not just one thing to say, oh, uh, a broadband deployment is going to generate a positive return. Uh, That's fine. There's probably a lot of them that do. But. You know, it, anyone who's been involved in business knows that you have only limited resources and unlimited um, wants, things you want to do with them. And so a lot of times it's not just a matter of does the project pencil out, but does, does one project pencil out more than another one? Does it have a higher return on investment? I think that's a lot of the decision that's being made is, you know, we've got a list of a thousand places we want to deploy. Um, I'm making the numbers up. Half of them don't pencil out. And then among the other half that do, how do we pick which ones? And, 
you know, I think there's some people, you know, with spreadsheets who are looking out there saying, well, we're going to start with the ones that generate the highest return um, because that's, you know, that, that's what the shareholders would expect. And so one thing that you could do would be to figure out a way to change that calculus in such a way so that you can generate a higher return in those areas that, that traditionally didn't uh, through some sort of um, supplier subsidies or even it could be as simple as just, uh, relaxing a lot of regulations. You know, you, not only do you have federal regulations, but you have state and a lot of times uh, municipal regulations that, that um, depending on where they are and, and how they work, you know, can cause some real burdens on on the supply side and hamper deployment. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, I just want to echo what Rob said. Uh, I commend Michael Riley's op-ed on the um, ACP continuance Um I know not everybody's a fan of the government spending lots of money uh, paying for things. However, we know it's going to, and this seems to be a very um, positive program that's had great effects and I think actually deals with a lot of the problems that that um, this NPRM is, is, is sort of trying to think about. Um, so we've, we've been in the weeds a little bit on the economics. I'd like to um, ask a, a question on um, the legal side a little bit in the weeds. So, as Jessica noted, there's some parties that are pushing for a very broad scope of authority for the FCC under 60506. Uh, the Supreme Court, however, has become increasingly skeptical of agencies assuming power over vast swaths of the economy um, without very clear direction from Congress. As, as Rob noted, um, the statute does not appear to have been written in a way that conforms with Supreme Court precedent um, uh, that would give it an effects based um, interpretation. Um, could you address how a major question challenge to 60506 would work if the FCC takes different readings of the statute? Um, maybe, Rob, you want to go first on that since you let off with those questions? Sure. So <clears throat> we could do a whole webinar on the major questions, Dr. So maybe we should. Um, but right now it's kind of just one Supreme Court case, and that's uh, West Virginia v. EPA, right? And so what's interesting about that case for – the ultra nerds on this call, um, and now we're sort of getting into the AP section of the class, is that Chevron's not cited in that case. So from a one case snapshot, one decision snapshot, it looks like the court is trying to build a parallel doctrine um, that would sort of overtake Chevron without overturning Chevron, if that makes mm. any sense, right? <clears throat> sort of superseded. Um, so what it effectively means for those who aren't in the AP section, but is Look, if if this is a major question not addressed by Congress in the statute that an independent agency is trying to interpret, um, maybe Congress needs to decide this issue. Uh, the issue that comes to mind is the, the regulation of broadband internet access under Title II of the Communications Act of 1934 uh, in the vernacular known as net neutrality, right? So with the Clean Air Act of whatever year it was and EPA versus uh, West Virginia, uh, that act, which is, you know, 40 years old or whatever it is, I'm not an environmental law expert, uh, mm -hmm. did not contemplate, uh, the debate over the presence of CO2 in the atmosphere and whether or not that has effects on the climate, right? So this court said, Congress didn't even know about it. this wasn't even a thing back when that statute was passed. Uh, so you, sorry, EPA, you can't put out these rules. I'm oversimplifying, but, uh, Congress needs to act. You can make the same case for Title II regulation of, of broadband. Uh, but in this case, you, we do have a fresh statute from Congress, 60506. So um, it might be a little bit harder for uh, an appellant, depending on the context of what, you know, to give you the lawyer's answer, it depends. depends on what the FCC's order is going to say um, and what it does. It might be harder for an appellant to say the commission can't interpret this because uh, this is a major question for Congress. And they'll say, well, Congress addressed it in 2021. Now, if we get a full commission and the FCC's order, which has to be produced before November 15th, is really ambitious and far-reaching uh, and goes into rate regulation and things like that, then yeah, maybe major questions doctrine starts uh, to pop up as a, as a possibility. I'd love to hear other thoughts. Anything you want to add, Jessica? I'll, I'll just note that I think, you know, from what I have gleaned, and I'm certainly on the outside of that, um, you know, the process that Congress undertook <laughs> and its bipartisan nature to get this passed um, is sort of 
you know, it's inherently fraught with these contradictions, right? Um, you can, you're not going to be able to go back to the congressional record and say, well, clearly they meant this and they meant that because as it's been told to us by staff that was there, you know, certain phrases that would have been clues either way were negotiated in and out of the legislation, right? So redlining doesn't appear because, you know, the Republicans negotiated a way. Now you can put in um, income level. So, you know, the, the contradictions in this statute are a product of that process. And I think some clues that the courts might look at to say, well, what was the intent here? And are we moving into um, controversial territory aren't there anymore because that was sort of the process. So, you know, that's the difficulty. It's easy for us to say, you know, oh, well, what did Congress intend? That seems like a clean test of things. But um, that's hard, right, when the margins are razor thin. Um, I guess they intended that they wanted to get something done, right? And they one group or the other got their pound of flesh somewhere else. Um, that's not a lot of clarification for courts that way. I think you do kind of have to look to past cases that um, the Supreme Court's been very cautious in saying, well, it might mean impact here, but it don't take that to mean that's what it means everywhere. Um, and that's certainly the direction of the court that's sitting there now. Uh, what lower courts would do with that, I, I guess, ping pong it around for a while. But um, I think that it's, it's not that um, uh, there's some answer to be found in what Congress intended. It's that this is like how the sausage is made, right? There are things that were traded in and out. And it's left the FCC with a very, in some ways, confusing and uh, dangerously open-ended <laughs> way to think about these issues as they go forward. I don't I don't envy them that. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of overlap in, in what they intended, too, was like, let's get some price data. Let's get some speed data. Let's get the good maps going. Let's find let's look at the economic evidence. Is there discrimination that's happening? Um, I also think these um, these rules aren't retroactive. That seems pretty clear um, in the way it was done. So that I mean, you know, who, who am I to say what people are going to argue for? But it looks like when you read it, um, there's some settled matters. Um, but I would expect that um, if this were interpreted too broadly, it certainly would be uh, a complicated case of litigation. That, yeah, that's helpful. I, and when I when I had looked into the congressional record, I discovered there was very little, if any, uh, congressional record to actually consult on it. So uh, I, I hear what you're saying on that. Eric, did you want to add anything on that? No, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I mean, it, it, it again raises the question of, you know, what is discrimination uh but even a bigger question of what is um you know what is income uh in terms of income discrimination uh, if you look at another program that's getting rolled out bead you know they want to have a middle class affordability um part of that and you know it, you could go look around there's no clear definition of what middle class income is um you know the other thing too is you know what's what is income discrimination uh i think i saw an ad last night at the, on the super bowl that I forget which one it was, but they were making fun of someone rolling out 10G. Well, what if someone decides to roll out, you know, some sort of 10G and they decide, well, you know, this is really expensive. We're going to, you know, we're going to, this is the gold plated uh, internet connection. We're going to roll it out to the high rollers first. Is that income discrimination? Um, some might say it is, but it's also part of the economic feasibility because that could be a lot more expensive and they need to charge a higher price in order to, to make that economically feasible. So I think there's, a, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of moving parts in this. And, um, yeah. um, and, and I think that uh, Congress intentionally made it vague to make the FCC's life hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And building on, on something Eric just said too, which is um, in the notion of what is, and, you know, what's the income threshold or, you know, what does that word mean? How does the FCC effectuate policy with it? The FCC asks questions about credit worthiness. Can ISPs inquire, you know, run credit checks on potential customers' credit worthiness? Um, and so if something like the ACP or Lifeline or uh, Connect America Fund or some of these other subsidy programs, if that's not helping this consumer, where is the gap they're falling through? And does that mean that an ISP has to be offering service to someone who's not credit worthy? And what do you do if they don't pay their bill? Um, and so these are, you know, you would think that would be part of the carve out uh, of it's not economically feasible, uh, that aspect of it. 
but uh, the commission is going to have to make that clear uh, up front or else we're going to have you know un unintended consequences that aren't good yeah that's fair um uh, we have one more question or q a but to put a bow on what we just dealt with it sounds like the answer to the whether there would be some some sort of challenge along the major questions line is it depends on how expansive the FCC interprets. It's a good lawyerly answer. Mm -hmm. It depends on how expansively the FCC interprets its its mandate here. If it is looking at, um, as Jessica says, on one end, collecting data, figuring out where there might be problems, developing a record there, it's probably fine. If it gets to the point where it needs to put a um, an adjunct from the commission uh, on every deployment board in every ISP getting into a major question that um, uh, could be shot down in court. Uh, the last question we have from our queue, I'll ask, and then we'll have a couple of minutes to wrap up um, individually, sort of bounces off of what um, you three were just discussing. Uh, GAO has reported that there are about 133 broadband programs and 15 federal agencies. How can these programs be coordinated to reduce duplication? And I think the broader question here is Congress – we know that there is some percentage of people that are are not connected and they're hard to reach for one reason or another. Congress has been trying to figure out ways to connect these people because we want to get everybody online. That's, I think, a broadly accepted social goal. But it's been spending money and spreading it around in ways that might be more or less efficient. Is there some vision that we should recommend to the FCC and more directly to Congress um, to figure out how to achieve these goals best? Uh, open to who wants to go first? We all and I'll speak at once. Okay. Uh, so I'll go first. Um, yeah. So, you know, this is classic sort of Washington, right? Welcome to Washington. So 133 programs across how many agencies did you have? 43 or something? It was like about 15 agencies. 15, oh, 15. Okay. Only 15. So no overseer, uh, one overseer of all of them, right? So probably a lot of uh, duplication waste, but also things falling through the cracks like we referred to a minute ago. Um, so that takes congressional action, right? And so IIJA is a good illustration of this. This did not go through the Commerce Committees, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it went, it didn't go through House Energy and Commerce. It went through, you know, appropriations or infrastructure and roads and, and stuff. But the 60506 didn't amend the Communications Act, for instance. And as pointed out in some comments in the NLI. So it probably would be helpful when we're talking about broadband to have sort of one uh, overseer consolidate <laughs> this, but that's going to take congressional action. Um, that would also probably have to take real White House leadership in this regard. Um, and so, you know, when, when is that going to happen? In the meantime, it's going to be like a lot of other federal programs where there's all this duplication and nobody knows what the other agency is doing or even that they were in the business of, of broadband, you know, so it's probably going to stay that way for a while. I hate to be a downer. Uh, very, very optimistic words from Rob. Uh, Je 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 yeah, Jessica, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, that's good. Now that Rob's gone ahead and been pessimistic, I can be my authentic self and say, I mean, it's going to be a disaster, obviously. <laughs> I mean, this is so much money. It's spread across all these. It's sort of like subsidized regulatory tragedy of the commons, right? <laughs> like, because it's no one's one responsibility. It's like no one's responsibility. So um I'm sure... Rob speaks um, more intelligently than I could about what could be the mitigating measures of, of how to address some of that. And I would love it if those things happened. Um, but I would just expect – it's not a great track record on us throwing money at this and, and making everything perfect, right? That's not how this works. And the fact that we're sitting here talking about whether or not how much customers have to spend on a product – should or should not be a consideration for offering them your product is might, I humbly suggest, belie a fundamental misunderstanding of how markets work and furthermore, how broadband markets are working. I mean, you know, this isn't it's problematic to have a certain number of people unconnected. But I will tell you something as inflation makes prices go up on nine out of 10 things, the price of broadband has come down. Um, it's not like these companies, you know, I just. I think it's convenient as a way to get more money and more central planning involved in these things to, picture, to paint a picture of these companies sitting in boardrooms, thinking of who they won't serve, give service to and sitting on piles of money. But I, you know, if you see sort of the U.S. as a global leader in this, um, 
they're doing great, right? I, I would put their record up against what we shall see. Uh, the federal government's rollout is of this. And, you know, in a, in a couple years, you can play this back for me. And if I'm wrong, I'll be <laughs> happy to have been wrong. But I'm going to say it, it's not going to be great. Yeah, I, I think I think that's fair. Uh, and I'll just add a, a note that not only has it been one of the only industries that has in times of inflation actually had price declines. It's all relative to quality, too. Uh, average connection speed around the United States has gone up. Reliability networks have gone up. So it, that that's why uh, it's hard to understand what Congress is trying to accomplish if it's not more on the fact gathering side. But I'll, I'll leave Eric to uh, give the final thought on this, well, this topic. Well, now you guys touch on two things I want to hit. One on the, the declining prices. I mean, I'm I'm old enough to remember, you know, when there wasn't an internet, uh, <laughs> you know, I remember having dial up and I remember just being beside myself when I got like my first DSL connection. And I mean, that wasn't much faster than dial up and it's probably, uh, probably in actual dollars, it probably costs the same as what I'm paying today. In other words, on real terms, it's probably, you know, cut in half or more from what we're paying yeah. today. But the, the other thing too, on all those programs, um, you know, I am not optimistic that they will ever be streamlined. And I think that there's, there's kind of a reason for that. Uh, you know, cause if you look at every program, you know, it's one of those things like, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, you know, a lot of people <laughs> joke that the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a broadband program and people say, why are they doing that? Why, why isn't it an FCC program? Well, you go ask and it makes sense. Uh, or it could make sense. You know, uh, some of the, the worst uh, access and adoption rates are in rural areas, right? And you can argue that in rural areas, they have uh, less access. Uh, people in rural areas are more familiar with working with the USDA and their programs than they are with the SEC and their programs. And so the USDA seems like a natural place to put a program. I think it's called Reconnect mm -hmm. America. Um, and so one of the things, sounds like a good idea at the time. You do enough of those things that sound like a good idea at the time. Fast forward 20, 30 years, and you've got, you know, 130 programs across 14 different agencies. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and how, you know, it, I think it would take some real, um, uh, some real political capital to rein that all in. And who wants to burn their political capital on <laughs> something like that when there's so many bigger fish to fry? I mean, we've got balloons flying over our country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, I, I think that's a great point, uh, Eric, and it offers an interesting point against my natural inclination, there's like almost a Hayekian argument that maybe some of these programs have actually grown up in a way that actually are all things considered as efficiently as possible serving some of these needs because of their curious, um, the curious nature of the populations they need to serve. Maybe it's worth thinking about. Maybe. That's a, maybe. That's a big maybe. It's a maybe, but I mean, it's important. If you were to start to all over, right, you, you, you rolled up your wagons uh, to the FCC and started all over, you'd probably do it completely different than how you're doing it now, but yeah. that's not the world we live in. That's a good point. Uh, so we have uh, about six minutes left. I want to give everybody uh, a minute or two to finish any thoughts. Jessica, would you like to go first with your final thoughts? Yeah, sure. First of all, because I don't leave, like to leave anything out there dangling, and I feel like we could count this as a win if we figure it out. I'm just going to mention that 60506, palindrome. Does that oh. mean anything to anyone? I don't know. That's not bad. But we, we're moving towards a solution. Um, secondly, and slightly less silly, but not really, is that I am a rural resident. I did not have fiber to my house, and I got together, um, Leslie, a year before COVID, and uh, my all the people who live on my dirt road, we hired someone with a trencher to come down <laughs> and lay fiber down our road and connect us, um, and it's great. And that's not everyone's situation in rural areas, but... Um, I made a decision about what to live, and there's a bundle of sticks that are advantages to that, and then there are a bundle of sticks that you either have to throw money at to fix or accept. Um, you know, I'm, I don't have big box stores around the corner, for better or worse sometimes, and Internet's one of those things. But I think what we can't lose sight of is that the big picture here, and Rob was talking about it, is that this is not the only way to connect to the Internet. And it certainly won't be the only way to do so in 5, 10, 15 years. That will be things I don't even, won't understand then and can't predict now. Um, Amazon's about to launch their satellite offering, too, on top of Elon Musk and everyone else is doing it. So um, I just think that this is old-fashioned and, and, and typical for me, but kind of that one-size-fits-all solution like this 
invites a lot of chaos and mistakes and waste. And um, I hope that on balance, this does more good uh, than than waste. But um, I, I remain skeptical. And, and this these questions are sort of a perfect example of that. Right now, we've gotten into really murky waters where um, it, it just it it. it illustrates to me that um, in, in a very sincere and well-meaning effort to solve this problem, we might have gotten ourselves into, you know, 20 or 30 more problems. Rob, you got two minutes for us? Sure. Uh, so first of all, I think the overarching takeaway is that the broadband marketplace has worked. Um, now I have a little thing. Can you hear me? Because it says unmute to start yeah. speaking. Okay. So I, don't know I hear you. Unmute. Okay, great. So broadband has worked. So in my very first op-ed um, in the Wall Street Journal in the summer of 2007, the title of which was Broadband Baloney, uh, there was alarmism about the U.S. falling behind and what we needed to fix that, uh, falling behind the rest of the world when it came to broadband uh, deployment and adoption. And what we needed to fix that was more regulation and government central planning, right? And I was arguing against that. So – Broadband is working. If 99% of the population has access to LTE and 5G is quickly being deployed uh, with tens of billions of dollars in CapEx uh, every year being deployed there, and that offers, by the way, an in-home uh, fixed broadband solution as well for Jessica's area, for instance, let's say, rural areas, um, or will, uh, you know, there's a lot that is good that has been going on and has been for a long time thanks to market forces and private risk capital. And wireless in particular has been less lightly regulated than let's say the Title II uh, DSL realm. Um, and, uh, and, and cable modem was less regulated uh, as well. And so it proliferated, proliferated quickly. So I guess my overall arching uh, advice to the FCC would be don't screw this up. Um, you, you have to be faithful to whatever Congress has mandated that you do because that's the, your job, but there's enough uh, discretion there to where you can say, okay, we'll invite complaints of digital discrimination. Let's see what the facts tell us and see what's really happening. And then you can go from there, but don't mess it up. Things have gone very well. So that's a great sentiment. Don't mess it up. Uh, Eric, do you want to, uh, <laughs> you want to take us home? Yeah. Well, in the, in the same frame of, don't mess it up. I think that, you know, digital discrimination, if you're looking at discrimination based on race, that's this, the national origin, it, it's not easy, but at least it's somewhat straightforward. But when you throw in income, income as a basis of discrimination is, is neither easy nor straightforward. And my concern is by throwing income in there as, you know, more or less a protected class, um, we're opening up a whole can of worms that could also really mess up the other kind of more straightforward forms of discrimination that we're trying to eliminate. And I really hope that the, the FCC thinks really hard, not just about what they are doing or trying to do, but also what the, the, the dynamics and the, the, the implications of what they're going to do uh, will, will be down the road as, as firms have to try to, to live in this new realm of uh, the IIJA. So, again, don't mess it up. <laughs> Don't mess it up. Uh, yeah. And so and on that note, so we know the FCC has to do something with uh, income because it's in the statute, but they have discretion. And I think all three of us are saying or all four of us rather are saying don't mess it up. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, again, this was a webinar from the International Center for Law and Economics. If you have follow up questions for our panelists or would like some further material, uh, feel free to respond to the email invitation that you received. And we'd be happy to um, connect you with the resources you need. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thanks.